Television is a serious medium. It's an inner-oriented medium. You are the vanishing point. It goes inside you. You go on an inner trip. It is the prelude, the vestibule to LSD. A great deal of what he was doing was quite frankly throwing things out to see what they looked like the next day and how people would react to them. Many of his pronunciamenti were not meant to be. They were not analytically structured. They were metaphors. And he was convinced that the metaphors were worth wrestling with, but he was not always convinced they were true. You see, all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again because they were bureaucrats. They weren't turned on. But with electric circuits, Humpty Dumpty goes back together again with a rush. Most people did not get their understanding of McLuhan from reading his books. The books, particularly as the 60s wore on, became less and less coherent. And this is partly because McLuhan was not interested in writing books. His favorite mode of communication was talking, talking ideas out. He wanted to get his ideas across to many people, so he did appear on television all the time. And um, I think that um, it cost him. But when you see that juice being poured out on spaghetti, that is good TV. You glug, glug, glug. That is great TV. Very good. Thank I'm you. I'm going to uh, read the book again. I still don't understand it. But... TV itself is a kind of happening, technically. And it tends to involve people in its own vortex. The media themselves can now create events that are so much bigger than people, so much bigger than the audience, that it really is a new mythic form. The coverage of the Vietnam War is done by more people than who are actually fighting in Vietnam. The numbers of people covering Vietnam business around the world and participating in it through newscasts, the numbers are many, many millions. And so the war then becomes a fiction, a colossal fiction. The user of electronic services is largely deprived of his private identity. Or, and his physical body. <laughs> Remember the Cheshire cat that came on smiling minus its body? Yes, and that's disappeared us. all but that, the... That's us. We really? Are, just like the Cheshire There's cat in Alice here in Wonderland. Four smiles. It's people who are sent, not the message. I must say, you send me. I find whenever you're on, we talk faster, we do... <laughs> I think about it for hours afterwards. You know, it's been fun. Do you know what's going on in some great American homes? Well, let me tell you. Sears Best Interior Latex Paint. It must be hard to be the almighty totem pole. I mean, what do you do if you become the media guru, but you're aware of the fact that you're being asked to give sound bites and God knows what else? And uh, how do you get out of it if, if the media is, in fact, what you're talking about? It's one of the most painful parts of understanding McLuhan is when you read his letters beginning in the early 70s and he realizes his message has not gotten through. Nobody's really listening. What do you think is the most, uh, uh, I, want, I want to use the word effective, but that's not the right word, but I'm talking about television here. Uh, what has the greatest impact on audience? From, is a TV program. Is, is, is television best when it covers an event like a space shot or the Olympics or a baseball game? Is it best when it tries to entertain with, uh, with movies at night? Uh, when it tries to inform with news programs. I'm sure that McClune was not satisfied that he'd been understood towards the end of his life. My f own feeling is that he felt that uh, people had not bothered to understand. I think he felt keenly that his academic colleagues never really were ready to give him a hearing or to respect him. He became involved in a club called the Best Club at the University of Toronto. And this Best Club consisted of people who were heads of their own centers. 
McClellan enjoyed these get-togethers. This is obviously a select group of academics. But amongst themselves, they themselves, these people, could not come to a conclusion as to whether McClellan was a really great thinker or whether he was a charlatan. That question was hung over McClellan to the very end. By 1974, a series of works have appeared saying, in effect, that either McLuhan is wrong or McLuhan should not be taken seriously because he has a hidden agenda, whether as a Roman Catholic or as a conservative in terms of his values. The chief charge against McLuhan was simply to say, he's a technological determinist. What he says is, the machines make the rules. McLuhan's enduring phrase is, nothing is inevitable provided we're prepared to pay attention. And he never gave up to the end of his life. With Laws of Media, McLuhan was attempting to advance a new science. Marshall is a tool maker. He likes tools. He wants to give you tools. His probes have been very simple until now. Suddenly he comes up with his grand unified theory. I started working with my father in the middle 60s. 10 years down the line, 1974, the publisher of Understanding Media had asked for a revision. So we started there and we finished with this project called Laws of Media. We were looking for universal laws, and we found only four that everything does. But these four questions ask you to look at what are the ripple effects? What other areas are affected, irrespective of the content? And you begin to realize media are like languages. That is, they're far more powerful than anything they're used to say. The idea that media and innovations and so on are human utterances with the properties of language, this is new. It's also extremely ancient. So the grammarian used language and the metaphor of language as a way of understanding the universe. He read the heavens as a text, he read the earth as a text, he tried to discover laws, and our laws of media are a new foray in that very ancient way of understanding.